All right, the message today is entitled P-B-P-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. Anybody know what that stands for? You got to be old like me to know what it stands for. And you had to have been part of, part of evangelical culture of the late 60s, early 70s. Otherwise, you have no idea. Charles, thought it was a, Charles Wolf thought it was a placeholder until I got the real sermon title in here. <laughs> Anybody know what it means? Ruth does. What does it mean, Ruth? Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. It came from, from a, a, a seminar that was wildly popular among evangelical churches in the late 60s, early 70s by Bill Gothard called the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. It has since been retitled, a better title, Institute in Basic Life Principles. It was kind of a Stephen Covey before there was Stephen Covey. And, and he, he talked about the, uh, the seven life principles, principle of design, principle of authority, responsibility, suffering, ownership, yielding rights, and moral purity. And the, the whole idea was this is what God is doing and directing our lives toward these, uh, toward these seven principles. And they're universal principles, and if you step out of line with them, it, uh, you're probably going to have problems. And so they, they, that's what it was about. And it was, it, it's really great stuff. I, remember I took a youth group uh, when I, in 1980, and uh, we, we, we didn't see Gothard live. We saw a video likeness of him uh, for the week in Sacramento. It was a full a full five days in the seminar. Um, unfortunately for Gothard, he, he, uh, he's trying to finish well, but he, he had some problems back in 2014 and was forced to resign his position. Uh, but the principles, I think, that are in here are, are excellent, and uh, he's trying to recover from that even right now. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Really, Paul could say that because his life had been threatened on numerous occasions in the book of Acts, and yet he is still living because God has a purpose for him, one in which, we might add, Paul is cooperating. The Lord wants Paul where? Where is Paul headed? In Rome. Rome's the capital of the whole world at the time, right? That's where God wants. God has even told him, I'm, going, I'm sending you to Rome. You're going to go there. And even though... Even though they have all these forces kind of against him, he is going to make his way to Rome because God is in control of things. At the end, he's been threatened on numerous occasions. So here's what this message is about today. Until you have taken your last breath on this earth, God is not finished with you. Ah, that's good news, isn't it? Because, man, you know, we, we mess up. And it's good to know that our mess-ups do not have to be fatal. That God is the God of restoration. We can make U-turns. We can still proceed towards God's purpose and will for our lives, even if we've been rejecting it. Just ask Jonah someday when you see him. Just ask the Apostle Paul someday when you see him. God isn't finished with us as long as we're breathing. As a representative of Jesus... Our responsibility is to be a blessing to all in order to win a hearing for the gospel. So those two concepts are, are woven in our passage today from Acts chapter 28. Now those of you who have been with us for the last nearly three years will be happy to know that 28 is the final chapter of Acts. All right, we've been at it a while. Right? You may be Acts. Well, I'm not, I mean, this is, I've loved it, but of course, I'm doing the messages, so I have to study it. You just have to listen, hopefully study too. Here's the first point today. God determines your fate based on his purpose for your life. He does this without violating your will. Acts 28, starting at verse 1. After we were brought safely through, and that was everything that Charles talked about a couple of weeks ago, the shipwreck and all of that, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened to his hand. See, this is exciting stuff. I don't know why you guys can be bored with this. So there's Paul, the snake on his hand, all right? 
When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, well, no doubt this man is a murderer, I guess instead of trying to help. No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. <laughs> they were waiting for him to swell up <laughs> or suddenly fall down dead. But when they waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Crowds are fickle. <laughs> all right, so let's break this down. First of all, again, you need pictures, you need maps. So here we go. Paul had taken off from Caesarea over here in Israel, went to Sidon, went, uh, went around Cyprus to Crete, and at Fair Havens in Crete, um, they'd had to make a decision whether to go on or not. It was getting close to winter. You don't sail in winter in those days. Paul said, don't go. They said, well, we're going to go anyway. So while they went, they ended up over here in Malta. Before they got here, I'm in front of the speaker. Better watch it. Before they got there, they, there was a bad storm, and they crashed, literally in Malta, at a place now called St. Paul's Bay. So that was the, the course, that, and Paul's trying to get up to Rome, all right, up there. So that's where he is right now. Second picture. This is a cargo ship of Roman days. This is what the ship would have looked like before it got all broken up. Actually, uh, that's a cutout, so that's maybe what it did look like after the crash. I don't know. But all the cargo was put below there. It was a cargo ship. It was not a military ship, by the way. There were soldiers on board, but it was, it was a cargo ship. Next picture. This is an anchor of a cargo ship just like that that was found just uh, in, in Caesarea, underwater, of course, not, not, but uh, underwater in Caesarea, a place I've been and would love to scuba dive there, man, because this is the kind of stuff I uh, undoubtedly would see. Well, that's an anchor from a Roman cargo ship of the first century that's there. Sec next picture. Uh, I don't know why that's there again. Oh, these, these, are, the uh, these are, are what the stuff would have been in. So they uncovered stuff like this is a, a bronze statue of, of a Roman sun god. Next. Uh, these are some other artifacts from that same crash that they discovered. So this kind of stuff that would have been on board. This is bronze. And what they would do with bronze stuff is they would take it and they would melt it. And they were into recycling in the first century. And so a lot of times these ships carried a lot of bronze and they would recycle it. Okay, next. It, bad news for the sun god. He was about to get melted, which is, <laughs> which is ironic, isn't it? And then these are a bunch of coins they found that took the shape of, of the, the clay jars that they were in. Okay, next. All right, now here's Malta, a, a, a bigger view. So they ended up up here at a place called St. Paul's Bay. Now, how do we know that it, was, that it was there? Well, it had been traditionally, it had been dubbed that, but in 1880, a, a British scholar by the name of James Smith did a comparison of what Luke wrote here in Acts chapter 28 and the topography of St. Paul's Bay, and he really established beyond any reasonable doubt that this was it because the description that Luke gave matched perfectly there. He was the first guy that really did an in-depth study of that. Okay, next. And there's, there's, there's the bay. Not bad, huh? Man, when God ships wreck, it's not bad. That's what it looks like today. In fact, I'd, yeah, I'd love to go there. Okay, I think that's it. Nope, one more. There's another picture of the beach. So you can go there today and, and, and maybe find the, the ship that, that Paul got stuck in. All right. So Paul and the rest of the passengers find themselves shipwrecked here on Malta. Once again, Paul's life was spared not only from the shipwreck, but also, as you found out from Charles a couple of weeks ago, when, when, the, when the ship crashed, the soldiers on the ship wanted to kill the prisoners, of whom Paul was one, because they didn't want the prisoners to escape. Prisoners escape bad news for, for Roman guards. But the chief guard, the centurion, said no, because he had grown kind of attached to Paul, did not want Paul to, to face this kind of a demise, and so he, he said, don't, don't kill him. And so they didn't, so they land safely. Now, it turns out that the people on Malta, the Maltese, were very helpful. Luke uses term, the term barbarians, or in, our, in, in the ESV, the, the term is natives, to describe the people on Malta. Barbarian was a word that was commonly used by the Greeks to refer to those who did not speak Greek. It doesn't mean that they were, quote, savages. It just meant that they didn't speak Greek. And it's, it's a... It's an, I'm glad Glenn is here today because it's an onomatopoetic word, Glenn. <laughs> All right, what it means, what that means, the word sounds like what they're trying to describe. So the babbling of the Greek speakers that those who didn't speak Greek, it sounded like babbling to them, thus the term 
barbarian because blah, 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 okay? Like the count or whatever. So that's why, that's a, it was just a common term. It would be like us saying um, foreigners. So that's, that's why Luke describes them that way. Now Malta had been inhabited a thousand years before this time by Phoenicians. Phoenicians were known as a seafaring people, and they made their way to Malta. Uh, Phoenicia was just to the north of, of Israel at the time. Uh, but by, two, by the year 218 B.C., uh, the Romans had taken it, but the Romans gave them, as they gave many people, a lot of autonomy. And you shouldn't think of these people as uneducated savages because they had a pretty cool civilization there. They were known for domestic architecture, for the, what their houses looked like in Malta. So, the, so the, they're not, they're not uh, uneducated and they're not um, totally without uh, resources. They, they, they had a, a civilization going. All right. Luke says that they were showed unusual kindness by the people. It's, you know what the word is? The word is uh, philanthropia. What, what word do we get from that? Philanthropic or philanthropy. Uh, it has to do with, with being kind to another human being by giving them something that will help meet their need. It's the only place that word's used in, in the New Testament. It's referring, it's referring to people being kind to, in this case, Romans and the Apostle Paul, who was a Christian. So it's not referring to Christians of one another. It's referring to those who are not Christian. So it starts to rain, and the Maltese come and they build. They see the crash, and rather than try to take advantage of the people in the crash and the Roman soldiers, they build a fire for them to warm them because it starts to rain. Luke says that they welcomed all of them. Now, on this kind of a cargo ship, there were about 276 passengers and the total people on it. So this is no small crowd. Okay. Paul helps out, as you would do, as, they, as he sees them start to gather wood. He goes to gather wood, too, to put it on the fire. And so Paul has a stack of wood. He throws it on the fire. And either before or as it starts to warm up, a snake, <laughs> he got a snake, too. And the snake attached itself to Paul's hand or arm in some way. So you've got to picture Paul as standing there like this with a snake dangling from his arm. Not a position you would like to be in or I would like to be in. Now, there are no poisonous snakes anymore on Malta, but in Paul's day there were. And so here, there he is. Now, the Maltese people see that and they say, Ah, there is justice in the universe. This guy thinks he escaped. He's got to be a murderer See, that's probably why he's a prisoner. They didn't know any details. But, and so even though he got to escape this horrible crash, justice knows better. Now, they're not just talking about the term or the idea of justice. That was an actual name for a god. Justice, a goddess, actually. So it's the word, um, not Nike. I always get this messed up with Nike. That's not it. Uh, it's it's uh, D-K, D-I-K-E. And so that was the name of the goddess. So they said, Justice knows better she's going to kill this guy through the snake. So they were expecting Paul to start showing signs of being bitten by a poisonous snake by either beginning to swell up. And I don't know if they pulled up a chair to watch. This is their entertainment or, or what. But they, they, were, they were watching. They expected him to just drop dead. Neither happened, and they waited a long time, it says. Neither happened. So now, rather than say this guy's a murderer, they thought, well, this guy must be a god. By the way, this is the second time that Paul was mistaken for a god in one of his missionary trips that happened in the first journey at a place called Lystra. They first thought he was a god, and then he said, no, I'm not a god, and so then they tried to kill him. <laughs> in this case, it's kind of the other way around. So they changed their minds, Luke says. The point of all of this, the point of all of this is that God wasn't done with Paul. And so nothing was going to stop him from getting to Rome. Not a Jewish mob in the temple, which was the first circumstances of the arrest. Not three years of incarceration in Caesarea under two different procurators, Felix and Festus. And I showed their pictures a couple weeks ago. You will all remember that, I'm sure, if you don't remember anything else. Not a shipwreck. Not soldiers who wanted to kill him, and not a poisonous snake. Okay? Paul was going to get to Rome, and God was going to see to it that he got to Rome. God determines your fate and my fate. 
based on his will and purpose for you and I. Now, that's a com- I hope it's a comforting thought. This doesn't mean that you and I should be reckless, like go test it. Okay, God, I'm going to go ride. I'm going go, uh, to go swim with the great whites today. Since I know you have a purpose for me, I'm sure I'll be fine. Okay, that's, that's not the idea here. God's purpose may be for you to be eaten by a great white, and then you go, you don't know. So it doesn't mean that we're reckless with our life, but your life and my life truly are in God's hands. Now again, that's a very comforting thought, or at least it should be. They're in the hands of a God who loves us, who has an idea of what he wants to accomplish through us, and is going to make sure that that happens. He has a purpose. He will see to it. In Isaiah chapter 46, the prophet Isaiah is writing, uh, he writes, speaking of what's going to happen to, to the Babylonians. The Babylonians had captured the, this, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, taken them into captivity, and destroyed the temple in the process. They hadn't destroyed it yet, because this is actually 200 years before that happens. But Isaiah writes, And he's writing about what's going to happen to the Babylonians from the perspective of God. And in verses 9 through 10 of chapter 46, he writes this. Remember the things I have done in the past. Now, he's addressing this to Babylonians, by the way. Remember the things I have done in the past. For I alone am God. Now, the Babylonians had a lot of gods. I alone am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens, Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. It's Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 from the New Living Translation. Now this raises a very real and good question for all of us. If God is going to fulfill his purpose in us, are we aware of what he wants to do? Paul was. He was very clear. I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I'm called by God to do that. You're probably not called to do that, but what are you called to do? Do you know what, the, what your calling is? Big C, not your job. Your calling. Do you know what God wants to accomplish? What is the reason for your existence? What does God want to do with you? You are not, according to Scripture, an accidental byproduct of a random universe. You're a person created in the image of God for a reason. You have great dignity as such. That's why we hold human life dear. We and we alone of God's creation are created in His image. It says in Genesis, male and female, the genders are necessary to be created in God's image. And a lot of other things too besides that. Our ability to respond to God, our ability to the self-consciousness we have as human beings, all of those. Part of the image of God in us. Now, George Bernard Shaw, who was a great British playwright, he wrote um, what became My Fair Lady. It wasn't called that when he wrote it, Pygmalion. And, and um, he was certainly no believer. But he writes this, We should all be obliged to appear before a board every five years and justify our existence on pain of liquidation. Now, Strange thing for an atheist to say, uh, I'm not sure I want to appear before his board. Because if God's not the chief, that means some humans get to be the chief and tell other humans what to do. So I'm not a fan of that. Because that usually hasn't ended so well. That's why we have the system of government we have. But the idea of knowing your purpose, knowing why you're here, is valid, isn't it? How much more should those of us who know Christ have an idea of why, why, what he wants us to do. Have an idea of purpose. Now, I don't think you have to go on a global tour to find your purpose or have to start peeling back layers like you're an onion. I, I think God's purpose is readily available to you. You just, you just have to stay in tune with him and ask him. He has a plan for you. And he's likely placed you right where he wants you already in order to do what he wants you to do. Who does God want you to influence for him? What, ta- what task does he want you to accomplish, or tasks? Our purpose is probably right in front of us, if, if you're unaware of it. Well, you don't have to beg God. I think he's more than willing to let you know what it is. More eager than you probably are. 
Now, the amazing thing about God is that even though he has a plan for you and he will not, he will not violate your will in doing his plan. Now, how can he do both? I'm not sure. But I know that he has a plan. He'll make sure it happens. But he won't violate your will in the meantime. How do I know that? Well, because we have all through Scripture those who rejected or resisted God's will. And he let them go. One such instance is in the, ver uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, where Luke is writing about the Pharisees, and John, it's in the context of John the Baptist, and, um, and it's an example of the Pharisees saying to God, no thank you. Here's the passage, Luke 7.30. But the Pharisees and experts in religious law rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. These guys rejected God's plan for them. Well, what was it? Well, as a part of the nation of Israel, they were to be a blessing to other nations to show the other nations what God was like. That was the, the, the purpose for the nation, big picture purpose. They were also personally to recognize that John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah. They were held responsible for that because it was in their scriptures. And every Jewish Christian in the first century tried to point that out to them. Messiah has to suffer and die. That was Paul's message to the Jews over and over again. Messiah had to suffer and die. Jesus suffered and died, was resurrected according to the Scriptures. You're responsible to know that. You're supposed to be God's people. So you can read, but they refused. You can refuse God's plan. But before you do, please understand that God is never ultimately frustrated by anyone. He will either leave you to your own devices or he will compel you to, fo to follow his purpose. Jonah and Paul are two examples of being compelled. Jonah, go to Nineveh. No, I don't think so. I'll go to Tarsus. Jonah, here's a fish. <laughs> now will you go to Nineveh? All right. <laughs> Paul got knocked down on the road to Damascus on his way to kill Christians. God, will, he, he can compel you. Normally, he doesn't work that way. You can resist his will. C.S. Lewis said it this way, in the end, there are only two kinds of people, those who say to God, your will be done, or those to whom God says, your will be done. In Romans chapter 1, we have a very long uh, explanation of how that works, where God is saying, I, I, it, Paul says over and over, I gave them over to do what they wanted to do, basically. There are two judgments described in Scripture. One in 2 Corinthians 5.10. This is a judgment that Christians face at the end of our life. When we die, we go up here. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all, not just some of us, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now this is a, a, a judgment geared to those who have received Jesus, those who will be with God in eternity. And it's a judgment based on reward. I don't know how that works in heaven, frankly. I, I do know that all competition is, is going to be nonsense, so it's not going to be, well, I got more reward than you did. You have to kind of take that away. But the point is, is that you and I are accountable, even for our Christian life. We're accountable for what God has given us, the gifts he's given us. We're accountable to serve him. And that judgment is for that, accountability. What have you done? There's another judgment called the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be part of this one. This is for the unbeliever. And in Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 11, it says this, John writing, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. So death doesn't get you out of this, by the way. Standing before the throne, books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's not a very popular passage to read these days. But it's there. We can't ignore it, can we? There's judgment. We are responsible. God, like any good leader, makes us responsible. He gives us stuff to do and says, now I'm going to hold you accountable to it. 
for believers, what are you doing with the gifts I've given you? What are you doing with your life in serving me? How have you appropriated your salvation in your life to serve me, to serve others, to love me, to love others? We are held accountable for that. And while there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, we, we are accountable. So we can say no. And yet, God's going to make sure. God's going to make sure that we accomplish what he wants. And Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 says this, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, either judgment seat of Christ or great white throne, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly await him. So, God directs our lives according to his purpose, and yet he doesn't violate our will. How does that work, Mike? That's contradictory. Well, not really. But it's there. So you can be sure God's going to accomplish what he wants to with you. You can be sure you can also say no, and in the end he will still accomplish what he wants, but he will not violate your will. It's fascinating, isn't it? Second point today, be able to recognize opportunities for blessing others in a way to open their, as a way to open their hearts to the gospel. So here's what happened next, starting in verse 7. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were all about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. All right, just, as, uh, just a couple of notes here. An, uh, another act of hospitality was offered by a guy named Publius. He was like the chief magistrate of the island. Uh, the lead politician. The us that Luke refers to in the passage is probably not all 276 passengers, but more likely it is Luke and Paul and, and Julius the centurion and probably some of his attendants. The rest were probably scattered out throughout the island. But this guy had, had, had Paul. Isn't it interesting? Paul's a prisoner. But he's being treated by the chief magistrate like a guest of honor. God has a great sense of humor. Paul finds out that the father of Publius is sick with a fever and dysentery. I don't need to describe fever and dysentery to you, do I? So that's what he had. Not a pleasant state of health. Paul prayed for him. He lays his hands on him, and the man is healed. The irony is that Luke is the doctor, but Paul heals the guy. And Luke is humble enough to write about it. And Luke didn't even include, and I helped. <laughs> he just says, Paul laid his hands on the guy, and the guy was healed. Now, just as with Jesus, word got around, and sick people become, began to come to Paul. There's, there's never any shortage of sick people. Just go to a hospital. You will see. So they all came, and by the way, when you're sick, that's all you can think about too, isn't it? How do I get out, and how do I get well? So word got around, people start to come to Paul, and, and he, he cures him. And so we have a very much an image of what Jesus did, and also the promise being fulfilled, you guys are going to do greater things than I did. And Paul is blessing, and he's empowered to bless them in this way, by healing them. Now you and I may not possess this ability to miraculously heal people of their diseases, but you and I do possess the ability and are empowered by God to bless those that we come into contact with in the name of Jesus, and it is not hard to do. Is it really? It's not hard to do. I mean, something as simple as paying for somebody's meal, something as simple as going to a neighbor when you know they have a need. I've told you the story before, but I saw my, this, this woman who lives two houses down from us. She was mo trying, to, trying to, to use, a, she was using a hatchet to edge her lawn. All right, so her husband died about two years ago. She's a little woman from Vietnam who, who, who 
got married to this guy who was a serviceman. She came to the United States about 1976. Her name is Tian. And, and um, she was out with a, I said, okay, this is real. So I, I, I said, look, I'm going to, I do this. I mow people. That's my gift. My dad taught me one skill. Well, I, my dad compelled me to learn a skill against my will. <laughs> and I learned how to mow lawns. And I, I'm, I'm kind of glad for that one skill I have in my life that involves my hands. So, um, so, I, I'm, so I'm mowing her yard now. You would think, I mean, you would think that I am doing, you know, like I'm spending hours helping her. It takes one hour about every three weeks. It's nothing. It's nothing. And yet the value of it to her is it's like it's infinite. It doesn't take much. We just have to go see what's out there and be willing to, in the name of Jesus, go do something for somebody so that... When, when the subject comes up, as it has with us, we have something to say about the gospel and about Jesus and about why we do stuff and about who we are as followers of Jesus. That's really all there is to it. Most people will respond to kindness when we are, the, when we are kind in the name of Jesus. We went a hearing for the gospel. 35 years ago, Joe Aldridge described it this way. The gospel has a message, words, but it's set to music. And you need to learn both how to say the words of the gospel and sing it. What we do in the name of Jesus is the music. What we say is the content of the gospel. And both are needed. That's why Jesus said they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They re they're really the, the opposite side of the same coin. We do good works in the name of Jesus just as he did. And when, the, when it comes up, we share the content. People do need to know what God requires of them. We have that. Trust in Jesus for your Savior. You need a Savior. Sorry if that offends you. Trust in Jesus. It's not a difficult message. A child of five can understand it. I did when I was five. Of course it grows and it matures with us. But the message itself is fairly simple. Paul instructs us this way in, in Colossians chapter 4. He says this, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity, some opportunities you don't get again. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive. Not, you dirty knock. No, that's not gracious and attractive. Let it be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. It's not hard, is it? It's not hard. Band, come up. So on this voyage, Paul's leading, being led to Rome, and it's demonstrated to him once again that God wants him in Rome. That is his purpose. But along the way, God has also given Paul opportunities to bless people with who he is. He's blessed the centurion, the sailors, now Publius and his father. The gospel compels him. It is his life purpose. And by the way, it makes him a better person than he was before the gospel entered his life. He was a Jewish terrorist beforehand. What's your purpose? Do you live a life of service to the gospel, compelled by the gospel to be a blessing to all? God is not finished with you yet. Here's the next step this week. Find an opportunity this week that God gives you. Don't try to invent it. Just look around, and he will. That God gives you to be a blessing to someone else in the name of Jesus. If a gospel opportunity follows, in other words, if you get to share the content of your faith, then by all means, step into it. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are not done with any of us because all of us, right now, before the heat gets to us, we're breathing. And so, Lord, we thank you that, that, if, that even though we can look back on our lives and say, oh, man, I blew that opportunity or I did that and you must be really disgusted with me, that... That's a message coming from the enemy because what you want us to focus on is right now. Our sins are forgiven. And so, Lord, help us to focus on 
the opportunities in front of us right now that probably are part of the purpose and the reason you created us and saved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.